Welcome to the I Am In event brought to you by the Voice of the Martyrs. We have a wonderful event ahead of us. And I want you to know that there are people all around the world who are tuning in along with you. Through this event, we're gonna hear firsthand stories of how God is growing his church in places that have been dominated by Islam. As that growth is happening, there is also persecution of our Christian brothers and sisters. You're gonna meet three people who have endured that persecution and hear how God sustained and encouraged them through it and is still using them today to build his kingdom. We're also gonna worship the Lord together and we'll be led in that by award-winning artist, Stephen Curtis Chapman. First, let's look at what it means to be in and what it meant for Christians as ISIS swept over the Nineveh Plain 10 years ago. اسمع برا طلقات نار اسمع عالم عم تصرخ ولاد عم تبكي المسيحية لازم تطلع انتو نجسين انتو بلدين لانو هني اصابوني برصاصة برقبتي دبحوا وكبوا بالسائي اوه صار يقوى الضرب شوي شوي صرنا مضا نطلع in 2014, Christians were being marked for death by Islamic terrorists, marking the Arabic letter N for Nazarene on their houses and vehicles. This shocking news sparked an outcry by Christians around the world who used the symbol in protest. نحن عشنا بمجتمع فيه أديان كتير بس ما كنا نعرف بالنسبة لقلنا نحن ببيتنا ما كنا نميز بين هذا من طائفي هذا مسلم هذا مسيحي هذا شو ما كانت طائفته أو شو ما كان دينه ما كنا نميز بيناتهم أبدا كان عندي أصدقاء كتير كنت أسمع شغلات ما أعرف ليش عم بيقولوها يعني ممكن أفوت العين من على الغرفة بالصدفة أسمع عن عم بيقولوا المسيحية خنزير مسيحية <تصفيق> بلشت المظاهرة تطلع بلش الأصف يقولوا لنا المسيحية لازم تطلع أنتوا نجزين أنتوا بلدين تاني نهار المس... المس... الداعش استولت على قصير بشكل كامل بيوم من الأيام كتير قويت لحد ما فات فاتوا صار يفوتوا على البيوت كنت قلوا خلينا نطلع يقولي لا يقولي لا لا ما تخافي هلأ أنا بطلع بشوف شوفي استنيت ساعة تنتين ثلاثة وفي حسيت كتير في قواسات برا فتحت الباب لقيت الدخان كله في كتير دخان برا شو عم بيصير لقيته حارقينه برا اركض اركض شوف العالم عم تركض اركض معهم كنت ما عاد ما عاد فيني اتحمل هذا موقف ابدا بالاخير ما بعرف كيف بالاخير وصلت على البيت على بيت اهلي فقال اعتنف وهي داعش يا هناء فبتضب غراضك انت وبنتك وبالمحل ما بتكون امك وبيك بتروحي معاهم يعني يعني صرت اترجاه انه ما يرجع على قصير عم قال لي لا ما بيكون راح تاريخي كله ياتو اللي خدمته بيكون راح هلا هلا بس اثناء فوت الدواعش اكيد لا اخذوا الدواعش عرضوه للقتل سبع ساعات ضربوه ابره مازوت بالوريد ملحو كانت طالعة روحه بعد ربنا يسوع الساعة ثلاثة بالليل أوي صار يقوى الضرب شوي شوي صرنا مضا نطلع ما عاد فينا بدك تلبس شي على راسك لتقدر تطلع مشان ما تنعرف لأنه إذا عرفوك مسيحية قتلوك نمشي مشي 
سائية هيك نعبي منها بدنا نشرب أكل ما في لو وصلنا سجر بستان صنع نحوش وناكل لحتى وصلنا للحدود اللبنانية وصلنا لهونيك كان في خيام وشوادير بيوت عرب عالتراب عال معاناة سنوات وسنوات وسنوات قد ما أحكي عنها قليل بعدين ساعدونا شوي نقلنا في خوري هونيك عرف انه نحن مسيحية نقلنا على المطار ودخلت بنتي مدرسة الرهبات الباسيليات الشواريات لمدة أربع سنوات كنت أنا أشتغل بالتنظيف بمدرسة الرهبات وشكر لكم كلياتكم وشكر للقسيسين وللكنيسة الإنجيلية بشكر كل فرد فيها كمان وكل إنسان ساعدنا وبعد انتقلنا معجزة ربنا يسوع المسيح بحياتنا بطلب من الرب يسوع يكتر معجزاته بحياتنا يا رب نحن لحد هلأ عايشين وعايشين ولح نعيش بفضل ربنا لأنه ربنا ما بينسى حدا وما بيترك حدا أبدا Christianity in Jordan right now we have 13 million population uh, only 160,000 Christian uh, ISIS uh, arrived and kicked out a quarter million Iraqi refugees uh, Christian from their homes or well, because the refugees the churches uh, in Jordan is growing uh, we are uh, great partners with, uh, with the voice of the martyrs our focus to provide for them education medication and support their self with dignity. This is our role with them. James chapter one help us always to look at the Lord. He give us joy and give us strength and he uh, answer our prayers. Most of refugees, they said, thanks God uh, for ISIS because before ISIS, we are so far from the Lord and after ISIS, we know Jesus and uh, we are so thankful. The symbol of N has become a banner for rescuing, serving, and ministering to our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world, those who have sacrificed it all for their faith. Will you answer the call? The first thing that persecuted Christians ask us to do for them is to pray. We want to respond to their request right now. So we've added specific prayer time into this virtual event. As we come to these prayer breaks throughout the event, you'll see specific ways that you can pray on your screen. If you're watching in your church, perhaps you'll have someone lead the entire congregation in prayer. If you're watching with your family, you can pray together right now. You may even want to write these requests down to keep praying for them in the weeks to come or to share them with a Christian friend. Let's go to the Lord right now in prayer on behalf of Christians facing Islamic extremism.
Thank you for taking the time to lift up the needs of our persecuted family members. We're gonna do that throughout this event. And honestly, I hope you do it throughout the year. Now to introduce our first speaker, Heather Mercer was serving the people in Afghanistan in 2001 when she and others from her ministry organization were captured by the Taliban. More than 20 years later, she is still working among Muslim people. Let's watch this video and welcome Heather Mercer. When she was 24 years old, Heather Mercer was one of two American women in a group of eight international aid workers and 16 Afghans arrested by the Taliban for their work in connection with a Christian aid organization in Afghanistan. She was put on trial by the Taliban for proselytism. One month after Heather's arrest, a terrorist organization protected by the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, launched a successful attack on the United States. The 9-11 attacks shifted the course of history for the United States and for Afghanistan. Mercer became briefly famous, a young American woman held prisoner by this group that most Americans didn't know anything about before 9-11. Heather and her co-workers were miraculously freed after people around the world prayed for them and after U.S. soldiers entered Afghanistan and pushed back the Taliban. Heather and one of her fellow captives, Dana Curry, published a book about their experiences entitled Prisoners of Hope, the story of our captivity and freedom in Afghanistan. Since 2003, Heather has been heavily involved in serving and reaching out to people in northern Iraq. Heather's primary passion is to see Jesus exalted in the church and in the nations, and to mobilize the body of Christ to pursue God's heart for Muslims. To all of you who have joined us today, it is a joy and a privilege to be with you to share a story of God's presence and faithfulness in my life during a time of real uncertainty and challenge. But before I get into that story, I have to take you back to where the journey began. It was a Sunday morning in 1997. I was a college student sitting in my Sunday service. And I was asking God, what is it that you want to do with my life? And in a season of prayer, and I was studying God's word, scriptures started to come to life, passages like Matthew 24, 14, that says this gospel will be preached into all the world and then the end shall come. Scriptures like Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. And as I would read these scriptures as a young believer, remembering very much what it was like to be lost. I was confronted with the reality that there are millions and millions of people around the world who've never had a chance to hear the name of Jesus. And I remember learning at that time that there was only one Christian worker serving among every one million Muslims around the world. And as I was sitting there that Sunday morning, the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, Heather, how about a million Muslims? And I thought to myself, if that can be the leverage point of my life, then I will sign up for that. And that was 1997. And I started on a journey to learn more about how God was working in these places around the world where more than 88% of Muslims had never even had a chance to meet a follower of Jesus. I learned about Afghanistan. This was during the time of the Taliban. They were in power. These were the days when it was illegal for women to walk out on the streets without an escort. They were wearing burqas. It was illegal for kids to fly a kite or for people to play chess. They were executing women at halftime in the soccer stadiums. I had a chance to go to Afghanistan for the first time in 1998. And that trip completely changed my life. And I remember seeing things during those days that, that I couldn't unsee. And when I got back on the plane after that first short trip to Afghanistan in 1998, I remember saying to the Lord, if you will send me back here, 
I will come back and spend my life uh, living among the Afghan people. Well, God heard that prayer and honored that prayer. And in 2001, I joined with an international relief agency that was working in Afghanistan to be the hands and feet of Jesus in a part of the world that was desperate for hope and desperate for help. And I knew going to Afghanistan that it was a place where there were risks involved. Nobody goes to that part of the world without knowing the risks. Before I went to Afghanistan, a lot of people said to me, Heather, you're crazy. Why would you go to a place like that where it's dangerous to be a Christian, where it's dangerous to live your faith, where it's dangerous to talk about Jesus? Living and working among the Afghan people, I found out that many of them did want to hear about Jesus. They wanted to hear that there is a God who sees, that there is a God who hears. And one of my favorite stories is that of a young man named Simon. Simon worked at the house where I was living and he was the door watchman. And I remember one day the parents had gone out to run some errands and Simon and I were back at the house taking care of the kids. And Simon saw a scuffle out on the streets Taliban abusing and harming the Afghan women who were getting their rations of food for the month. And he came into the house and he was so angry. And he said to me, I hate my people and I hate my country. And I listened to him share where he was at and I thought, Lord, how do I answer Simon's pain? And I said, Simon, God teaches us and, and gives us strength to, to forgive those who cause us harm and to forgive those who hurt others. I think God would want us to uh, forgive. And he looked at me and his eyes got really big and he said, Heather, I want to accept your religion. And I said, Simon, I, I don't know if I understand he was a Muslim, this was Afghanistan. I said, Simon, you wanna accept my religion? And he said, yes. I said, you mean you wanna you want accept Jesus? And he said, yes. And that night, not really knowing what to do, knowing the persecution that Simon could face, I said, when our team comes back, we'll, we'll talk with you tonight. That night, we sat around the dining room table in secret and we talked to Simon about what it would mean to follow Jesus. And we said, Simon, you need to know one thing, that if you decide to follow Jesus, it could cost you everything. It could even cost you your life. And with great desire and frustration, he put his elbows on the table and he looked at us and he said, what does it matter anyway I have nothing else to live for. Jesus is the only one who will satisfy me. And that night we gave him the book of Psalms in his language and his name in his language was David. So that night he read the book of Psalms in his language about a man named David who lived in a day and time that looked very much like his own. And he said as he read the Psalms that night, a presence came into the room and filled him with such tremendous peace. And he wrote in the back of his Bible, I select Jesus for my life. And the next morning, Simon was out in the courtyard, belting out the Psalms and without any concern for the Taliban who were on the other side of the wall. Because they want to know that there is a God who sees and there is a God who hears. Well, it was because of relationships like the one we had with Simon that the Taliban were able to watch and, and target myself and my colleagues. And on a fateful day in, on August 3rd, 2001, we'd gone to visit the home of an Afghan family whose children were a part of a, a, a pro program, a job skill training program that we did. And that day we shared the Jesus film with this family. And as we wrapped up the film and said to that family, very much like Simon, 
The message of this film is for all people, but you need to count the cost if you decide to believe. And that day, as I wrapped up showing that film with my colleague, we were leaving the home of the Afghan family, and I went to get into my taxi. And I looked at my driver and talked to him for a moment, and I will never forget that he looked in the rearview mirror with a look of utter terror. And I didn't know what was going on. We started to drive down the road. A man dressed in civilian clothes hit the hood of the car and got in the back seat with me. And then I knew something was wrong. I was taken to what became the first of four prisons. And when I arrived outside the gate, I saw my colleague sitting in a car in front of the gate. And I knew that what had happened uh, was a setup. That began 105 days in Taliban captivity, where myself and seven others of my colleagues were taken captive. And we were tried under Islamic law for crimes against Islam, tried before the Afghan Supreme Court for a crime that at that time was punishable by death. Our days in prison started with weeks and weeks of interrogations. Sometimes we would be interrogated for 10 to 12 hours at a time by a group of Taliban who would come into our cell and, and circle us and pelt us with questions about who we knew and where we'd been and who we'd talked to. And in those early days, my colleagues and I looked at each other and we thought, this is where everything that we said we believed, gets put to the test. And that first night in captivity, I'll never forget, my colleague and I, we held hands laying on the floor of that prison cell. And I was reminded of a scripture that God had spoken before I ever moved to Afghanistan, a scripture from Isaiah 43 that says, Fear not, for I am with you. I have called you by name. And when you walk through the waters, they will not overtake you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Fear not, for I am with you. And so that night, we wrote our very first worship song in prison called Fear Not. I don't sing. I can't sing. But that night, we sang that song with a heart of worship. And the other Afghan women who were in that prison cell with us came over to our the window of our cell and listened to the worship music. And we saw God at work in that situation. As we sat around during those days of captivity, we realized that God must have a much bigger plan. Because when I read the scripture, it doesn't just say that God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that only some could believe in him. But God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that even the Taliban could know him. And one day my colleagues and I were sitting in a, around our cell and we were talking about the fact that we'd been arrested for showing the Jesus film. And the Taliban were all sitting in their offices watching the Jesus film to find out what was on it. We thought, wow, God has an amazing way of making sure that even people who are enemies of the gospel have a chance to hear about his love. Well, those days of captivity went on until 9-11. And we were in captivity on the days of 9-11 and I'll never forget my captor coming into our prison cell and giving a report that didn't make sense. Two planes had crashed into each other over Washington, D.C. and New York City. But that didn't make sense. What did that mean? And it wasn't until we actually were freed from prison that we knew what had happened during 9-11. During those days of captivity, we watched the Taliban beat the other inmates, sometimes beat them within an inch of their lives. One night, the Taliban were beating a man on the other side of the wall so severely 
And that man started to sing. And as I sat there and heard the sounds of this man being beaten and tortured, I remembered a song that I used to sing before I ever went to Afghanistan. There is a light in the darkness and his name is Jesus. There is a light in the darkness and his name is Jesus. It was singing that kept us going during those days of captivity. Every morning and every evening, our, the group of women, we would get together and we would spend time in prayer and worship. And we wrote, wrote many worship songs. God would give us scriptures to hold on to. And one of the, the scriptures that God gave us was out of Psalm 118 that says, I will not die, but live and proclaim what the Lord has done. And we held on to those scriptures during those days, believing and trusting that God would accomplish all that was in his heart through that experience. But it wasn't always every day was a brave day. There were many, many days that I struggled with fear. In fact, there were days where I, I wrestled with God and I thought, Lord, I, I've only been here a few short months. I've just started. Is it already over? There was so much about the experience that I couldn't explain that didn't make sense. And I wrestled with God. And I remember one day being so gripped by a spirit of fear that I felt paralyzed to move, paralyzed to talk to God, paralyzed to pray. And that day, I, we did have a Bible, and that day I grabbed my Bible and it opened to a passage in Matthew where Jesus is talking to his disciples and he says, if you try to save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake and my kingdom, you will find it. And what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his own soul? I knew that scripture God was using to speak to me that day. He said, Heather, you're trying to save your life, but instead you've lost it. Heather, are you willing to lose your life in order that you might find it in me? And I thought the question that he was asking is, Heather, are you willing to give your life in Afghanistan for the gospel? Maybe that was part of the question, but really the question that God was asking is, Heather, do you trust me? Heather, do you believe that I'm good and that all my ways are good and that my plans for you are to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a great hope and a great future? Do you believe all the things that you believed before you ever came to Afghanistan? Do you believe that those things are still true? And by God's grace alone, I was able to get to a place that day where I said, Lord, you are good, not because of what you do or how you choose to work out the situation, but you are good because that is who you are and your goodness does not change. And I tell you that moment where I said yes to God, you have my life, you are the one in charge no matter whether I live or die. That was the moment that God took a key and unlocked the prison of fear that I was in. And I find it so ironic that God had to send me to an Afghan prison to set me free. But that is exactly what he did. And at that point, it didn't matter what the outcome was because he was near and present in that situation. For the rest of the days of captivity, his presence became the anchor for our souls. We sang many other songs. We wrote a song telling the Lord we wanted to go home. And that became an anthem in our worship in the days that remained in captivity. As the war in Afghanistan started and escalated, we knew that one of two things would happen. Either there would be a fight in the capital where we were in prison and we would be released, 
or the Taliban would flee and take us with them. Well, it was the latter one that happened. The Taliban came one night on November 12th and piled us into the back of a pickup truck. They were taking us to Osama bin Laden, who was believed to be in Kandahar. And as we traveled through the mountains of uh, Afghanistan, leaving Kabul towards Kandahar, we were surrounded by all the fleeing Taliban, their tanks and their trucks. And in the back of this pickup truck, we were uh, with armed Taliban guards. And in the back of that pickup truck, we started to sing the songs that God had given us in prison. And a peace that truly passed all understanding filled that pickup truck. The Taliban eventually put us into what was our fourth prison. And when we were in that prison, the U.S. started uh, attacking strategic Taliban strongholds in that city. Well, the Taliban got scared. They fled and abandoned us in the prison. But we didn't know that. We were sitting in this prison, hearing the fighting going on outside, wondering what do we do next? And then all of a sudden we heard a group of angry men come and start beating down the door of the prison below. And then we started to hear their footprints, their stomps coming up the stairs. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the moment where it all ends. We have just a few seconds left to live. And I remember praying what I thought would be my last prayer. I said, Jesus, I pray that you would help us to die honoring you. And right then, a group of opposition fighters ran into our prison cell. They looked like Afghan Rambos and had a rocket launcher in one hand and an AK-47 in the other. And they said, come on, let's go. And we said, well, where, where are we going? They said, we're taking you away from here. We ran through the streets of this Afghan village and realized that this village had just been liberated from the Taliban. And as we walked through the streets of this village, women started coming out from their front doors for the first time with their faces uncovered. Men were dancing in the streets and people were shooting their guns in celebration. It was like the Macy's Day Parade and we were the lead float. And as we walked through this village, and I was just talking to God about what was happening, he said to me in my heart, Heather, what is today? And I thought all the days had run together. It was November 13th. And he said, Heather, what happened nine years ago today? It was nine years ago to that day that I had decided to follow Christ. And in that moment, God said, Heather, I have ordained every single day of your captivity, just as I have numbered the hairs on your head, because I wanted you to be set free with the people that you came to serve. And I want you to know I can set you free from any prison that you were ever in. I knew in that moment that that whole experience was one that had been allowed by God for his glory and for our good. So much has happened since that time. I came back to the United States. And when I came back, I thought, I have a decision to make. I can tell the same story for the rest of my life, I, or I can carry on in the work that God has called me to do. Well, I chose the latter, and for the last 20 years, I've had the joy of living and working in Iraq uh, through an organization I started called Global Hope, ministering to women, doing education, empowerment, economic development among a very similar people. And the lessons that God taught me in prison are lessons that I continue to have to dig in deep to every day over the last 20 years. When I came back, uh, right after the Afghanistan captivity experience, and I had a chance to share my story. I was speaking at a church in Arizona, and I'll never forget. At the end of my talk, 
we had an open mic, and a young girl came to the, to the mic, the first to ask a question. And she said to me, how old do you have to be to serve Jesus overseas? And I said, well, how old are you? She said, I'm 10. And I said, well, you're perfect. She looked at me, not quite satisfied with that answer, and said, well, how old are you? A few minutes later, she came up to me with her mom in hand. And I will never forget, her mom said to me, ever since my daughter has been 10 years old, she's been saying, mommy, when I grow up, I want to go serve Jesus in that part of the world. And mommy, when something bad happens to me, don't be sad because I'm doing what God has told me to do. And I remember listening to this girl and thinking to myself, I want more of that spirit that you, that you carry. And so I said to her, I said, I'd love to pray for you, but would you pray for me? I prayed for her, I don't remember exactly what, but she put her hand on my shoulder and she prayed these exact, these exact words. She said, dear Jesus, I pray that you would send Heather back to Afghanistan to tell lots of people about you. And dear Jesus, when Heather goes to prison the next time, help her not to forget the next time which she forgot the first time. That was the most significant prayer that anyone has ever prayed for me. And I think it's a message for all of us. As believers, we are not guaranteed a life of ease, a life without suffering, quite the opposite. But we all possess a Rolodex of God's faithfulness in our lives. We all possess a testimony of times where we have called on his name and he has come in a way that we could never have imagined. And so I leave you with that word. May we not forget the next time what we forgot the first time. We all can deal with fear in our journey with Jesus. He will call us to things that are more costly and more uncomfortable than we ever thought we were signing up for. But he promises, just as he said in Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always. If we know he is present with us, if we know he is near, if we know he is faithful, then whatever the cost, whatever is required for the assignment that God has for us, he will be more than enough. And he is good, not because of what he does. He is good because that is who he is. And for us as, as believers, that's the message that the world needs to hear. We live in a day and time where it seems like there's more conflict and turmoil than there's ever been. And there are so many who still wait to know that there is a God who sees and there is a God who hears. And when we step into that assignment that God has for our lives, trusting in his goodness, trusting that he will be enough for whatever comes, we will see him do more than we could ever ask or imagine. And I wanna close with one story that for me became the more than I could ever ask for or imagine. After returning to the States, I heard a man share a, a story about an Afghan who had gone to Pakistan and was looking for a Pakistani pastor that he could talk to. And he finally found one. And when he met this pastor, he said to him, I wanna know how I can follow Jesus. And this Pakistani pastor said to him, well, how is it that you ever heard about Jesus? You you just came from Afghanistan. And he said, well, I was one of the captors for the eight foreigners that were held in a Taliban prison. And he said, every day I would listen on the other side of the wall 
and I would hear them sing and worship Jesus. And it made me wonder the God that they would serve, that they could worship him even in prison. And I wanna know that Jesus. He will do more than we can ask or imagine. Let us not forget to remember his faithfulness and his goodness as he calls us to follow him, even to the hard and uncomfortable places. God bless you. Well, hey everyone, Stephen Curtis Chapman here, and uh, I am so honored and very grateful to, uh, to be a part of this incredible story, the story of uh, Voice of the Martyrs, and to lead you, to encourage you uh, with some music. And um, so, here we go. The sky was clear, Kentucky blue, Led me high up the mountain to show me the view and said, wherever this journey takes you, just trust me, I'm already there. I had no way of knowing then just how hard the rain would fall, how fierce would be the wind. It's been beautiful and terrible, more painful, more wonderful than I ever would have known, even so. Gonna sing about the one who's given life to me. His love is unchanging, his grace is amazing. Still, I'm gonna praise the only one who always stays the same. I know he is good, I know he is faithful. Still, don't get me wrong, I'm still a mess. I've still got a heart with doubts and fears pounding in my chest And I've wrestled, then I've rested, then I've trusted, then I've tested God's patience Like a foolish man But when I surrender once again And I come like a little child reaching up my hands He lifts me every time And He tells me He loves me still I'm gonna sing about the one Who's given up to me? His love is unchanging, His grace is amazing still. I'm gonna praise the only one who always stays the same. I know He's good, I know He's faithful still. Yeah, yeah. And I 
will sing, I will sing of His faithfulness. And all my days I will sing of His faithfulness. And still, I'm gonna sing, I'm gonna sing about the one who's given life to me. His love is unchanging, His grace is amazing. Praise the only one who always stays the same. I know he's good, I know he is faithful still. I'm gonna praise him still, I'm gonna trust him still. He is faithful, he is faithful still. Saw it again today in the face of a little child Looking through eyes of fear and uncertainty It echoed in a cry for freedom across the street and across the miles Cries from the heart to find the where is the hope? Where is the peace that will make this life complete? For every man, woman, boy, and girl looking for heaven in the real world. To stand in the pouring rain and believe the sun is gonna shine again. Know that the grave is not the end To feel the embrace of grace Across the line where real life begins And know in your heart You found the missing part There is a hope, there is a peace that will make this life complete For every man, woman, boy and girl Looking for heaven in the real world Heaven in the real world It happened one night With a tiny baby's birth God heard creation crying And he sent Heaven to earth He is our hope He is our peace That will make this life complete For every man, woman, boy and girl Jesus is heaven in the real world He is our peace That will make this life complete For every man, woman, boy Jesus is heaven in the real world Jesus is heaven in the real world Yes, He is And with the hands that form the world You washed our feet Kneeling down, you laid aside your majesty And you said for us to go and do the same So we serve for the glory of our King And you left heaven's throne to rescue what was lost Stretching out your mighty arms to bear the cross And you rolled away the stone, the victory won And you said, go and tell the world what love has done King of love, let your kingdom come 
Reign in us, your daughters and your sons. Fill us up until we overflow with your love. Until the whole world knows you are the King of love. Give us hearts that long to see your justice done. Let the river of your mercy flow through us. And let compassion be the loudest song we sing. Until the day when every tongue declares you king. King of love. Let your kingdom come, reign in us, your daughters and your sons, and fill us up until we overflow with your love, until the whole world knows you are the king of love. and your sons and fill us up until we overflow with your love until the whole world knows you are the king of love You are the key of love. Thank you, Stephen, for that amazing time of worship. You have heard a few testimonies of our brothers and sisters in Christ who have been persecuted at the hands of Islamic extremists. Through this event, you can encourage the millions of believers facing persecution. Let them know that they are not forgotten. Your gift to persecution response will help encourage members of our persecuted family in the wake of persecution and meet their long-term needs. Through this virtual event, our goal is to raise support for these Christians in their time of greatest need. Anything you can give will make a huge impact on these precious families. Please prayerfully consider what you would give. In the Middle East, Pastor John's church was raided, and his congregation's lives were threatened by Al-Qaeda fighters. The Islamists yelled, This land belongs to Muslims. In Ethiopia, Jamal was beaten and tortured by his father after leaving Islam to follow Christ. I would rather die than deny Jesus, he said. In Nigeria, Justina's husband Nehemiah visited a nearby village to baptize new Christians and was killed by Fulani Islamic militants. Still, she says, I will not stop singing. You can help Christians like these who have suffered persecution or for the families of Christians imprisoned or killed because of their witness. Such help will assist in the immediate aftermath of a persecution event and in meeting long-term needs like living expenses, children's educational needs, relocation within a nation, legal assistance, and vocational training. Your gift encourages these persecuted Christians to stand strong in their faith and reminds them they are not forgotten. When you give, we'll send you a free copy of the revised and updated book, I Am N which features inspiring stories from today's Christians facing Islamic extremists. Give now at imnevent.com slash give.
In 2015, one of my co-workers at The Voice of the Martyrs, Peter Yasek, was arrested in Sudan along with three Sudanese brothers in Christ. One of those was Pastor Hassan Abdurrahim Tower. One of Pastor Hassan's jobs in the Sudanese church was to prepare young pastors to face persecution. Little did he know that someday he himself would end up in prison. Let's watch this video and then meet Pastor Hassan. As a leader in the Sudanese church, Pastor Hassan Abdaharim Tower had the responsibility of training Sudanese pastors to be ready for persecution. He didn't know at the time he was also preparing himself for the day he'd be arrested and sent to prison. That day came late in 2015. Pastor Hassan was arrested and charged with aiding and espionage, along with VOM's Africa Regional Director, Peter Yasek. The two men, along with the two other Sudanese Christians, were put on trial. Pastor Hassan was sentenced to 12 years in prison. There were difficult days and terrible conditions during his incarceration, yet Pastor Hassan experienced the joy of the Lord, joy so powerful it brought tears to his eyes. He also found opportunities to minister, including daily chapel services where dozens of inmates would gather to study God's Word and join in fellowship. After an international outcry, Pastor Hassan and the other Christians were released. He and his family have settled in the United States, where he continues to serve the Lord. Because of the joy he experienced and the ministry God gave him in prison, Pastor Hassan looks back on those long months in a Sudanese prison as one of the best times of his life. Pastor Hassan, thank you for being willing to share your story with us today. You helped train young pastors to be ready for persecution. What, what was your curriculum? What was your message? What were the, the truths that you wanted them to really grab a hold of? Um, in 2012, when South Sudan gained its independence, uh, so the government of Sudan thought that uh, most of the Christians, they moved to the South Sudan. So our Islamic government started to put pressure on the churches by demolishing the churches, destroy the churches, and uh, kicked out all the missionaries out of Sudan. And uh, a lot of pastors were arrested. And uh, from that time, I was involved in uh, ministry that to prepare church for persecution. So my message was that to train the churches of pastors and believers to be ready and to know how they can behave or react when they face the persecution. So I started to travel from town to town to train pastors, to pray, uh, train uh, churches, believers, so they can be ready and uh, know how to behave when they face persecution. What were some of those lessons? Like how should they behave when they face persecution? Um, in Gospel of John, um, chapter 16, verse 33, uh, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take a heart, I have overcome the world. And uh, I want to let them to know that uh, persecution is real and it is biblical. And uh, Jesus has told us that we will face uh, persecution and trouble in this world. So they need to stand firm and they need to be ready if it happens. So they cannot be panic, but uh, to stand firm and have faith and trust in God. So when the day came that you were arrested, did you think back on any of those lessons? Did, did you feel like you were, you were prepared? I was really uh, prepared, well prepared, and I was ready. Uh, for that time, and um, because I was training the church, I was training myself, so I, I was ready. 
did you feel like this was kind of the test? Like, like you had taken the class and now, now it was time to take the test? Absolutely. One of the things when we had a conversation on Voice of the Martyrs Radio, you talked about the first five months that you were in prison as being one of the best times of your life. And you didn't have a Bible, you were locked away from your family, and yet you say it's one of the best times of your life. Help us understand how that could be, because obviously it was a very difficult time, and yet the Lord was there with you. Help us understand how that could be such a, such a precious time. Yeah, um, I know it, it was a difficult time uh, for me in the prison. And as uh, a husband and ha as uh, a father, uh, I was thinking about my kids, or my wife, my mom, my sister. Uh, it was a real difficult time. I don't know how they're living, if they have food, if the kids are going to school, I don't know. So it was a lot of pressure. Emotionally, I was really bad. But in other side, as I say, it was the best time because it was a time I was really close to God. Even in my loneliness in prison, uh, I was surrounded by Muslims and even ISIS in the room, in the cell. But it was best time for me because I was close to the God uh, by praying, praising, worshiping God, and thinking and focusing on God, and thinking about the, the goodness of the God. So I, I, I experienced peace in my life. I was experiencing joy in my life. I was experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit around me. And this thing is giving, really, giving me um, uh, confidence and peace. So I was not really thinking about what I was going through. And sometimes I just lay on the floor. Uh, that, one, that was my bed. I just uh, lay on the floor at night and just focus on the God. Just tear just come out from my eyes. And uh, it's not because of the hardship or, or the loneliness that I was uh, experiencing at that time, but it was the tears of joy. I just considered this, I don't deserve this, but I was thinking because God, he showed love for me just to share a little bit of his pain. And I just thank God for this. I just feel the tears and focus on the God. So this real time, the five months that I was spent in the security prison was the best time I've ever lived in my life. Wow. Uh, I think so many of us are just kind of, that blows our minds to think about that. But as you say, the presence of the Lord was just so close and so precious. One of the things that was an encouragement to you, and, and I know Peter has talked about this as well, when you went to your trial, the Christian community came and gathered around the courthouse and, and sang. Even, you know, as you mentioned, the, the Sudanese government had said, there aren't any more Christians in Sudan. And yet here were hundreds of Christians gathered outside the courthouse singing hymns, uh, really standing with you in that time. What, what did that mean to you to have the body of Christ show up in such a real physical way as you were facing this trial? Uh, it was really encouraging to us, especially when uh, we came out from, uh, uh, from the court room. It was upstairs there. And uh, we came out, and then I looked, me and Peter, they put the, the chain on us. I saw a big crowd of believers outside singing or worshiping. And uh, uh, I was just waving for them like this. And they're just screaming. And it was amazing. It was really encouraging to us because to see people are standing with us just uh, to encourage us uh, that we are with you, we're standing with you. It was really big uh, uh, help and it was really uh, giving us the confidence that, uh, yeah, how we can stand firm and face the court. Mm -hmm. Most of us who are watching this event, we can't go to the courthouse in Eritrea or China or Iran where our Christian brothers and sisters are on trial. But what can we do? How can we encourage them? How can we stand with them from wherever we are right now? One of the things is prayers. 
um, I could tell you that uh, in, in my first uh, five months in prison, I can feel the prayers of the believers. I feel it. And uh, in the spirit, I can, I can see, I can see people praying for us. And this prayer, uh, it really gives us strength and it lets us to be real bold. Uh, even you can come to the courthouse in the room, you can see us were smiling while we were facing the, the, the trial. We're smiling and uh, that's because of, uh, of the prayers. So the, the, the important thing is pray for the people who are really uh, Christians, who are persecuted, who are in prison. Uh, prayer matters and prayer is really key uh, that can help them and, uh, and protect them in, in prison. One of the amazing things I think about your time in prison is that, that you guys had a chance to have a ministry literally preaching every day in the, in the prison chapel. It, it seems kind of strange that the government would lock you up as a pastor and then say, but it's okay to preach inside the prison. What, what was that ministry like and, and how did that feel to be, to be seeing God work through you even though you were inside a prison? We just, uh, we just uh, know that we're here for a purpose, that God just signed us to come here in prison. And uh, as you say it, in outside prison, it's difficult to preach in the open air. Uh, but in prison, we're able to preach to the prisoners in prison. And uh, there's a big chapel, in, uh, chapel in, uh, in prison, and we spend all our day in that chapel, morning to the evening, uh, preaching, teaching, praying, uh, and uh, have the fellowship. Uh, and uh, not only that, but we have other, other prison for the people who are held for to be hung. And uh, I like that ministry because I felt in my heart that I was preparing people uh, to be ready if, if they face the death. And uh, I want to make sure that they accept Christ when, 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 when the time come for them to be hung or to be killed. And it was a real strong church. And, uh, this is this, this one of the things that uh, uh, we consider that God just sent us here just to preach the gospel to the prisoners. And um, one of my friends, he's a pastor, uh, he was encouraging my family that uh, Hassan, he has a mission in prison. When his mission ends, he will come out. And when I came out, when I was released, and then my wife told me that, I, I, I was really, I just, uh, I was smiling and I thank God. I say, yeah, I think I agree with him because that's, that's God's plan for us to be in prison, just to share the gospel with people there. On a, on a mission, on a mission in prison. Yes. One of the things that the Bible talks about is it talks about the disciples rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. You experienced the joy of the Lord, even laying on the floor of a prison cell. There are people watching this and, and they're going through a really hard time right now. You know, maybe they're not in prison. You know, maybe it's a health problem. Maybe it's a, a family situation. Maybe it's a work problem. How can you encourage them and how can you encourage us to rejoice even in those really difficult parts of life? Yeah, I will, I will, I will say that to them, as uh, Paul said, rejoice. And I say again, rejoice. As I said, the, 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 the hard time or some of the trouble that we face in this life is just part of our faith. And we have to, uh, we have to trust God and we have to be patient and wait for God to make the way for us. And uh, because he's not going to let us to go through all this uh, pain or hardship time, but he's going to make the way for us. Every temptation is just uh, uh, for time being, but God is going to bring the victory. He's going to bring a, a solution for us when we go to hard time. And um, I, I have experienced the goodness of God. And um, yeah, it's just uh, time being. Jesus tells us to bless those who persecute us. How, how were you able to do that? How can you encourage us to be able to bless 
people who are opposed to us? It is not easy. Um, as it was not easy for me because uh, uh, our prosecutor, they tend to, to humiliate us uh, by uh, taking us to the court and do whatever they did for us. Um, but uh, we, 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 just, we just come to the point that we need to forgive them. Uh, so forgiving one of the issues, if one of the key that we just forgive our, our enemies and, uh, and pray for them and bless them. And uh, that, that, is, that is what uh, uh, was in our heart, was in our minds, just to forgive them. Did you see any response from any of them, any of the prison guards or any of the courthouse officials? Did any of them soften towards you as, as you were praying for them and as you were trying to bless them? Or were they very, very firm and unaffected by that? Um, actually, um, the, the officer that was arrested me um, uh, when I was traveling to come to U.S., I was able to, uh, to meet him at, at, uh, at airport. Um, I saw him when he came in. So he saw me, but he was pretending that he's not seeing me. But I approached him and then I called him by his name and he was shocked and he stopped. And uh, I talked to him and, uh, and he, he started to, uh, to apologize that, uh, you guys, uh, we just, we just uh, were implementing uh, the, the, the orders from the above. Uh, I just told him that I know you, you are doing that. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not angry about you or for you. And he said, thank you that you, you are not angry about me and uh, you know that uh, we're just uh, doing what they want us to do. So yeah, I know this, don't worry about that. So it's one of the things. And uh, uh, he was really happy and said that I wish you safe travel and uh, see you again in Sudan. Wow. And, yeah. Wow. Pastor Hassan, thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. We're going to have a special time of prayer right now. You will see some requests on your screen, and I want to encourage you to pray, especially for Christians who are in prison. And just as Pastor Hassan was, pray that God will sustain them today. I can do all things 
through Christ who gives me strength. But sometimes I wonder what He can do through me. No great success to show. No glory on my own. But in my weakness He is there to let me know that His strength is perfect when our strength is gone. He'll carry us when we can't carry on. Raised in His power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect His strength is perfect We can only know The power that He holds When we truly see How deep our weakness goes His strength in us begins Where ours comes to an end And He hears our humble cry And proves again His strength is perfect When our strength is gone He'll carry us when we can Carry on Raised in His power The weak become strong His strength is perfect His strength is perfect Raised in His power, the weak become strong. His strength is perfect. His strength is perfect. And you're my in place safe in your embrace I'm protected from the storm that rages and when the waters rise and I run to hide Lord in So let your people seek you while you may be found. Cause you're our only refuge when the rain comes pouring down. You're my hiding place, safe in your embrace. I'm protected from the storm that rages And when the waters rise And I run to hide Lord in you I find my hiding place Lord, in you I find my hiding place.
As I look back on this road I've traveled I see so many times He's carried me through And if there's one thing that I've learned in my life My Redeemer is faithful and true And my Redeemer is faithful and true Everything he has said he will do And every morning his mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true And my heart rejoices when I read the promise there's a place that I'm preparing for you I know someday I'll see my Lord face to face Cause my Redeemer is faithful and true And my Redeemer is faithful and true And everything He has said He will do and every morning His mercies are new My Redeemer is faithful and true And in every situation He has proved His love for me When I lack the understanding It gives more grace is faithful and true and everything he has said he will do and every morning his mercies are new my redeemer is faithful and true Jesus is faithful and true. And great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee thou changes not thy confessions they fail not as thou hast been thou forever will be great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness and morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness Morning by morning New mercies I see All I have needed Thy hand hath provided Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. In the Middle East, Pastor John's church was raided 
and his congregation's lives were threatened by Al-Qaeda fighters. The Islamists yelled, This land belongs to Muslims. In Ethiopia, Jamal was beaten and tortured by his father after leaving Islam to follow Christ. I would rather die than deny Jesus, he said. In Nigeria, Justina's husband Nehemiah visited a nearby village to baptize new Christians and was killed by Fulani Islamic militants. Still, she says, I will not stop singing. You can help Christians like these who have suffered persecution or for the families of Christians imprisoned or killed because of their witness. Such help will assist in the immediate aftermath of a persecution event and in meeting long-term needs like living expenses, children's educational needs, relocation within a nation, legal assistance, and vocational training. Your gift encourages these persecuted Christians to stand strong in their faith and reminds them they are not forgotten. When you give, we'll send you a free copy of the revised and updated book, I Am N, which features inspiring stories from today's Christians facing Islamic extremists. Give now at imnevent.com slash give. Brother John Samara's father was the pastor of a large church in Damascus, Syria. As John grew up and got involved in the church's ministry, he saw more and more Muslims coming to faith in Jesus Christ. He also saw the price that many of them were paying for their faith. As the influence of radical Islam grew in Syria, the danger for Christians grew as well. And yet the church kept growing. Let's watch this video and then welcome Brother John. Growing up in Syria, John Samara heard the call to prayer shouted out from the minarets across the country of 24 million people every day. John watched his father, a faithful pastor, continued in ministry, including boldly sharing the gospel with Muslims, even as Syria descended into the horrors of civil war. John was pursuing a successful career in engineering when God called him to redirect his energies into supporting the rapidly expanding church in the Middle East. Today, John leads a team that proclaims the gospel in unreached areas of the Middle East and North Africa. They train and equip indigenous followers of Christ who understand their own culture, speak the language, and already live and work among their people to expand Christ's kingdom in the very heart of the Arab world. It's an honor to be here with you and to share about what God is doing today in the Muslim world and the beauty of God in the midst of brokenness. What we hear when we hear about the Middle East and North Africa, we hear a lot from the trouble that come from that side of the world. We hear about war, destruction, chaos, extremism, ISIS, and that all rise, that darkness, the death that have been taking place in the last 10, 12, 15 years, it's all we've been seeing is damage and destruction. But there is one side of it that we have not heard. There is one side you don't hear in the media, you don't hear about, uh, in anywhere else on the news, but about the goodness of God in the midst of the darkness taking place. We don't hear about what God is doing in such a dark spot in that part of the world. Since ISIS came, the cause and all that was taking place. There are many, uh, the, the revival that taking place in that part of the world, there is many reason and cause to it. One of the things that we saw through the war, the, 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 the fabric of family, the destruction of the fabric of family being uh, destroyed, where families are being refugees, a mother in one place, a husband in one spot, a child in one country. Religious oppression taking over that part of the world and many people, the leader are not coming through and they did not come through. And the cause of rise of extremism, ISIS and radical Islam, the economical collapsation of that nations, where the social aspect of it, there is no economy, complete devastation and destruction. All of that has caused many, many people in the Muslim world to seek for hope and to seek God. And some who have ran away from God, 
but many are turning to come to know Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior. And that because of the faithfulness of the church in that part of the world, that the church became a place of refuge, that the church became a place of hope and healing and restoration, that they were able to take the place of the family, the place of government, the place of uh, infrastructure, and they provide relief, aid, medical support for the people around them. And in the midst of all of that, they themselves, the church, were broken. Their people were displaced. And they're being attacked as a Christian for their faith. But they were the place for refuge for many. And that was the cause of revival. It's the faithfulness of the church and the destruction that happened all around them. In the midst of all of that, I remember one of the things that we prayed for that in the nation in Syria, I remember churches gathering and praying for revival to come to that nation and that people will experience the love of Christ and see what Jesus has done for them on the cross. I remember in hundreds, they will gather and they fast and they pray, Lord, come to that nation. That's way before the war, way before ISIS came. And they prayed that, Lord, come and let people experience your love. They prayed for revival, and we thought that revival is going to come to a nation, to that nation, in a, in, a, in a way you have experienced it here in the West as the Billy Graham crusade, where the big stadium is going to be, people are going to gather, and they're going to accept Jesus Christ and come down the aisle, and they're going to be taken into churches to be disciples. We thought of that, the concept of revival, that's what you have experienced here. But we praised so, and we cried for that. We didn't know how revival was going to come to our nation. It just came through war, through brokenness, through destruction that caused the wonder of the Muslim world about God. Where are you, God? And praise God because of the church and being a place of hope, healing, and restoration as they are being broken to provide healing, and it's most important becoming the spiritual healing for community. I remember we were church gathering back and during early of the war, and the gathering we were sitting and praying, and people are, the churches were packed, were filled. The courtyard, the other courtyard, the stairs, people out in the street, they're desperate to hear the gospel. And many of these people are Muslim inside the church. Some of them are fully covered but they're hearing and praising God and giving God the glory. This is what the church has experienced through ISIS and through that radicalism. I remember when we, early stages of the war, that the church would gather and pray. And as we begin to pray, the churches begin to decline in number. And when they decline in number, people fleeing, the Christians are fleeing. And the those who remain begin to pray, Lord, protect us, protect us, because they are being targeted by radical, by Muslim, like ISIS and ISIS. And, and, and be, people being kidnapped, sure, hundreds of churches being destroyed. We will gather and we pray in communities and hundreds of us. Lord, protect our men and children. The pastor, one of those pastors who was leading those prayer meetings, one day as we were praying for our safety and protection, all of a sudden he started praying for the radical, for the enemies. And when we pray over there, we don't pray just silently. We all shout before the Lord and you hear crowds of hundreds praying and crying before the Lord. And he would start praying for the radical. All of a sudden this calmness began to settle. Nobody wants to pray for the enemy. We are being killed. But he kept on going and going. Days after days, praying for an enemy until the Lord began to break in the heart of the believer of the churches and start working in us. And they slowly start praying for the enemy and we begin to pray for our enemy. The Lord changed our heart. Our prayer began to focus outward, when in, not inward. And when our prayer began to focus outward, we begin to pray for the Muslim. We begin to pray for the enemy. We begin to be the place of hope, healing, and restoration for the communities and for the Muslim community. And we begin to do an outreach. And God broke through 
into that Muslim world. That's what we're experiencing today. There are more Muslim coming to know Jesus Christ as the Lord or Savior in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years, and then the last 14 hundred years as a whole and the last 10 years has been the highest peak of islam coming to follow jesus christ i want to say that because of the faithfulness and the remnant of the christian believer who remain despite the hardship and persecution and suffering i remember one lady early stages she came she's a, and she said why are you serving helping the christian the muslim they're the one who are kidnapped my son they're the one who killed my son and and we they were our neighbor we ate bread but now you're helping them why you're helping them until the lord worked in her heart and changed her heart to raise a testimony to love the people who have hurt her own son fast forward 10 years later today one of our young leaders, uh, a partner and a friend of our ministry in an IS house that we work in the Muslim area, Middle East and North Africa. And he is a young leader, 14 years old. He was kidnapped and taken by group like ISIS. And he was taken at 14 years old. He was beaten to death just because he's a follower of Jesus Christ, 14 years old. And every day they walk in, they will force him to declare Islam and he would refuse. He said, I could not deny Jesus, but some one day because of the pain, I couldn't stop, I stopped screaming from my own pain. And I had to repeat that statement of faith that they made me repeat. He said, in my heart when I repeated, I felt like I was denying Jesus. They released him and he 21 years old right now serving as a leader in the church. He's serving among the people who have kidnapped him. Taking the gospel, that's what he does every day. He go with them, he eats, 20 years old, and discipling people. At the beginning, it was very hard. He said, I cannot see them in the church. But God worked in his heart to change and to be the man who is going to the same people who hurt him and taking the word of God. God is doing amazing things today that we cannot even imagine. There is a lot of pain and suffering. Even today, as I speak, there are more like ISIS group coming out. There are more suffering. The church will never cease to suffer. Radicalism, Islam is rising, but the church is growing in a way we have not ever seen because Jesus is conquering the heart of the people. One of the greatest things we see is the testimonies of the believers as they come to know Jesus Christ. One of the things that in the midst of the war and chaos, this Muslim family, she have seven young girls and one boy, a little kid. They're divided Muslim and they're from the city of Aleppo. She is fully covered Muslim. Her husband is a leader in the mosque. As she sat and taught her children how to pray the Islamic prayer five times to be a good Muslim, one time her young boy, child, after he was playing, he was exhausted. He went to the mosque with his father as he was leading his father to the prayer. He fell asleep in the mosque and he had a dream. And that just dream that took place just at the beginning early of the war in Syria. In the dream, he had a man in white appeared to him and he told him, you're gonna have a brother and he's gonna be named Isa. Isa is the name of Jesus in Arabic. There is no Muslim family named their son Jesus. He woke up panicking that child. He went to his father and his father said, it's okay. He's a prophet in the Quran, knowing nothing about who is Jesus, except as a prophet in the Quran. He wanted to tell his mom about having, about the dream, the dream, my mother, she already have eight kids. She does not want to have any more. So she started hushing him down. But he kept talking about that dream to his mom and to his dad. A year later, they had a son and they had a boy and they named him Isa. Through the war, a radical ISIS came into her house, 
4 o'clock in the morning. She had seven young, beautiful girls. She said, I felt so scared for them. They're going to be taken as concubines. So we packed and we began to flee Syria and to neighbor countries. As she got to custom, that neighbor country was overpacked with refugees. And she is looking, and the Asian was looking at her document, and he's looking at the names, and he started throwing the document back into their face, said, go back to where you came from. There is no more room for refugees. And he looked at the last document, and he looked at that, he saw the name Isa, Jesus. And he looked at the family, they're fully covered, they're all Muslim, all the young girls are Muslim covered. He said, who is Jesus? And the father lifted the baby up, took it him out of the crib, and he said, this is Jesus. The agent was overtaken. He said, because of Jesus, I'm going to let you all in. They go into that, and they hear about this church who is doing relief. She goes into the church, and her husband said, if they try to convert you, we'd rather die out of starvation, but not to convert to Christianity. And they named their son Jesus. They have no idea about who is Jesus. She started going, receiving bag of food and aid. And as she was receiving aid, one lady from the church saw her. He said, can I pray for you? This woman said, no, absolutely not. And she fled. The next week came to get her portion of food. The other lady from the church saw her. She didn't ask permission. She started praying for her. She grabbed her and started praying for her. She said, this, this mother, she said, something happened when she was praying for me in the name of Jesus. The next week she came early, started listening what the, what, what the Bible is saying. Later she became a follower of Jesus Christ. She hid it from her husband the whole time. All her children came to faith. Later, her husband was severely ill, needed blood transfusion. And there is no way for him to survive. And he's on his deathbed. She decided to share Christ with her husband. That night, he cried to the Lord, if you are the living God, if you are Jesus, the Son of God, revere yourself, heal me. When they went to the hospital to see one more attempt, the doctor looked and do after the testing and everything, he looked at them, shouting in their face, who did the blood transfusion? It was 100% successful. Where did you do it? The Lord, he's heard his body, and this man stood in the midst of the hospital saying, the blood of man did not give me life, but the blood of Christ has given me life. Today, they are church planted and are serving in that region. This is about the sovereignty of God that before a war, that God will reveal himself in dreams and vision to people. This is the fact that God loved the Muslim people. And we need to fight against the spirit of Islam. We feel as a Christian in that part of the world, we are not the victim. Yes, we are the physical victim, but they are the victim. They are under that prison of Islam, and we need to pray the Lord will release them from that in prison. We need to pray for what God is doing today in the Muslim world. One of the stories that happened through the midst of this war and ISIS, an imam, formal, he's a, a Shiite imam, a bunch of men from his mosque kidnapped young men from a neighbor town. They brought them to their mosque square, to his mosque square. And he said, in the midst of the mosque square, these men begin, our, from my community, begin to shout, Allahu Akbar, God is greater. And they slaughtered these young men alive in front of him. He said, separated their head up, up from their body, and, and shouting in the name of God and the greatness of God. He said, in retaliation, the neighbor town, the week after, kidnapped young men from my community, and they did the same thing. You could hear the cries and the celebration in their town as they're shouting, God is bigger, Allahu Akbar, God is greater. And he said, in my heart, I begin to ask, who are you, God, that we are killing one another in your name? How are you being glorified in the innocent blood being sacrificed just like that? This man is an Iraqi Shiite imam, and in one time he was walking by the church and he heard praise and worship and he walked and he sat in the last chair and he heard that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He said, when I heard about the love of God in my heart, 
I shouted, I have found you, God. I have found you. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. What we're seeing today and what's happening is beyond what we can imagine. Early in the days, when somebody come to faith, we all have the capacity to come around them and disciple them. Today, they are in thousands and tens of thousands are coming to know Jesus Christ. So we pray that as people come to know Jesus Christ, they will have deep knowledge of the word of God. That they're willing to put their life to death for their faith in Jesus Christ. So we want to make sure they know scripture well. I will never forget training leaders and working with leaders as we were sitting and meeting with them. And as we were waiting for them, they tried to cross areas and, and, and situation and valleys where it's a, where opposition and they would get bullet shot on top of their head. And every, every couple of months, they will sit and come and meet with us and they're under threat. And on the, just to cross to meet with us, they will face many threats, but they will come and they will spend the time just to study the word of God. And they will go back to their families the same way they came and build the church. I thank God for the commitment of the body of Christ in that part of the world. I think we have a responsibility to pray because persecution continue to rise and continue to rise as the church is growing. I pray that God will give us wisdom how to come alongside the body of Christ and how we can cry with them. They're not just far away. We are with them through the Spirit in us, and that we can feel their pain. I believe there are more and more persecutions coming against the church in that part of the world, and we seek prayer for the church and the growing church in the Muslim world. More than 100,000 Christians fled Iraq after their homes and businesses were marked by the Arabic letter N. But where are those Christians today? What about the believers who stayed behind? Is the Great Commission advancing in Iraq now? Let's watch this to learn more about our Iraqi Christian family today. هلا إذا بنحكي عن المسيحية بصورة عامة بسنة الألفين دعاني أنا على قلبي إنه أرجع للعراق 
من بغداد ابن بغداد انا عراقي الجنسيه وعلى قلبي انه ارجع العراق حتى اسس خدمه بالعراق وكانت هذيك بهذيك هذاك الوقت هذيك المرحله صعب بالامر هلا بوقت اللي انا بس رحت للعراق لانه سقط النظام بوقتها نظام الرئيس صدام حسين انا اخترت منطقه الموصل لانه هاي المنطقه صعبه ما كان حدا مفكر فيها وهذه المنطقه كانت هي كمدينه الموصل اغلبيه سنيه وفي اقليه مسيحيه لكن ضياع كلها ضياع مسيحيه فمن بلشت الخدمه انا بلشت زيارات للناس وبخبرهم عن رساله المحبه رساله الخلاص بنفس الوقت مثل ما احنا صاعدنا حريه نكرز وعم بنأسس خدمه صار في افكار متطرفه عم تكون موجوده وعم تنمى وهول الاشخاص المتطرفين اللي هن اسلاميين كانوا عم عم بطريقه غير مباشره يبعثوا لي ناس يحكوا معي بطريقه لطيفه وكنت انا عم بحكي معهم بكل تواضع بكل محبه لكن مع الوقت الاسلاميين صاروا بيكتروا وتوجه لي تهديد غير مباشر انه كنت انا اخذ مطرح مستاجره لبيت لإلي للسكن وبنفس الوقت للخدمه فانه اطلع من هذا المكان قال شيخ الجامع فتى فتوى انه ما بيسوى البيت اللي كان يقرا فيه القران يقرا فيه الانجيل ف وهيك صار احنا تركنا هذا المكان وشفت مكان اخر بعيد عن هالمنطقه حتى ما نزعجون لكن هن ما اكتفوا بهذا الامر نصبوا لي كمين كان يوم جمعه وكان شهر رمضان من الضيع المسيحي يعني رايح اجيب للمدينه نصبوا لي كمين وهذا اللي صار انه نصبوا لي كمين انا ماشي بالسياره شفت سياره وراي جاي مسرعه انه اعطيته مجال يعني حتى يقطع صوت رصاص وما بشوف حالي الا بيضد الدنيا قدام عيني ما بعرف كيف صفت السياره لانه انا بوقتها دغري جسمي راح وحسيت حالي عم بموت اجت قدامي صوره اولادي صغار ابني جوناثان كان عمره ثلاث سنين بنتي عمرها سنه زوجتي شابه صوره اهلي صوره الاخوه انت انت الراعي الصالح انت تهتم فيهم احسن مني استلمون انا عم غمض عيني يعني عم بستسلم الرب كياني بصوت ما فيني افسر لكم اياه قال لي قوم انا ما بدي اياك تموت انا بدي استخدمك ففتحت عيني وجددت قوتي بس جسمي ما بيتحرك بعد شي تقريبا شي ربع ساعة اجت سيارة الشرطة بيك اب شالوني وحطوني بالبيك اب لورا رحت لودوني للمستشفى ما في مطرح بالمستشفى هذا اليوم كان يوم اختيالات وهل الرصاصة بالصورة مبينة كانت نازلة نحو القلب رجعت غيرت مسارة رجعت طلعت ومن طلعت ما رأت من حد العمود الفقري أنا إصابتي عالية سي 7 وخلال الأسبوعين هونيك عرفوا في أنه أنا ما متت صاروا بدهم يخلصوا علي بالمستشفى الأخوة هربوني وبهيدي الأسبوعين اللي ضليت فيها حتى يوقف نزيف الدم كان في ناس كتير سمعوا بقصتي وأنا ما بعرفهم يوميا بشكل يومي بيجوا لعندي حتى خبرهم عن خلاص يسوع وكان في ناس عم تقبل الرب دموع وبعدين هربوني من بغداد ل... عفوا من الموصل لسوريا ومن سوريا للبنان وجيت هون وبعدين بعد ما تعافيت رجعت لكنيستي اللي ارسلتني هي الكنيسه لكن كان الاسيس ريمو دائما يقول لي بس انا ما بشوفك راعي مساعد انا بشوفك راعي كنيسي فعلي وراعي مؤسس قلت له انت بالعاطفه عم تحكي انا راحت علي انا من نص صدري ونزول انشليت فكنت شايف شايف الخدمه صارت مبهبط علي slowly god revealed ministry opportunities to share his triumphant story 
Eventually, he was asked to be the senior pastor of a church in Lebanon. أنا بصراحة اللي تعرفت على هالمؤسسة المباركة عن طريق أسيس صديقي هو الأسيس وهالمؤسسة كانت واقفة فعلا حد المتألمين وأنا واحد منهم في أمور كثيرة هي كان دعمي لإلي لاستمرار خدمتي بصورة خاصة هون بلبنان فنزلنا أنا وماري و كان عندنا هيك اندفاع لانه الرب دعانا والرب باركنا بالخدمه واستخدمنا بقوه. اما امرتك تشدد وتشجع لا ترهب ولا تخف لان الرب الهك معك حيثما تذهب. لا شك بوسط الالم بوسط الضيقات بوسط الاضطهادات احنا بشر. ينتابنا مشاعر الخوف فأنا محتاج إلى تقوية إلى تشجيع الرب يشجعني كثير بهذه آية وآيات مماثلة جدا يعطيني نعمة يعطيني قوة حتى أقدر أنا أجاهر برسالة المحبة Christians based in Muslim countries under the constant threat of death know that the gospel is a beacon of hope amidst the darkness What can we do? Pray for our brothers and sisters support efforts to help them through these challenging times and do it for the sake of the gospel. I want to say thank you for spending this time together with us. I hope that you've been challenged. I hope that you've been encouraged by what Heather and John and Pastor Hassan have shared with us. Hearing the stories of what God is doing in the Muslim world, I hope a sense of excitement wells up within you that the gospel is advancing. Muslims are coming to follow Jesus Christ. I hope that you will pray more fervently for people who are facing persecution, whether it be from their own family members or from the police or from their government. I hope you've kind of got new ideas about how you can pray for them and continue to lift them up throughout the year. And finally, I hope that you're excited to go and share the gospel with someone around you. Maybe it's not a Muslim, maybe it's a Hindu, maybe it's someone who's never heard anything about religion. But I hope as you see what our brothers and sisters in Muslim nations are doing, that you will put that into practice in your own life as well. We wanna see our neighborhoods changed, we want to see our cities change. We want to see our countries change. That will happen as the gospel advances. So I want to encourage you to continue to share, even maybe share what you've learned tonight with someone close to you. Let's pray together for our brothers and sisters who are facing persecution and for ourselves that God will use us right where we're at. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had together. Thank you for blessing our hearts. Thank you for challenging our minds with the stories of what you're doing around the world. Father, we celebrate the advance of the gospel in the Muslim world. We celebrate so many former Muslims who are now our brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you will encourage them. We pray that you will help them as they face hardship and persecution. Lord, some of them are trying to decide right now who they can tell that they're not a follower of Muhammad any longer. They are a follower of Jesus Christ. Give them wisdom about that conversation. Give them encouragement as they share their new faith with the people around them. Father, we pray for whole families to come to know you so that that first line of persecution will be crossed. They won't be persecuted by their families because they've all met Jesus at the same time. Lord, I pray for us as well, as we hear these stories, challenge our hearts, challenge our souls to be more bold and more open about our faith and our love for Jesus Christ. Use us to change our neighborhoods, to change our cities, to change our country. Help the gospel to advance where we are, as well as in the Muslim world. Thank you so much for the brothers and sisters that have shared, for the brothers and sisters who are watching with us all around the world right now. I pray your blessings and your encouragement on them. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this amazing event and this uh, gathering. Uh, it's my prayer. I know it's the hope and prayer of everyone that's been involved uh, and of all the team of Voice of the Martyrs that you have been encouraged, that you have been reminded that God is faithful, that he is good, and he is for us, and he is with us. So God bless you as you journey on for the sake of the call. Nobody stood and applauded them So they knew from the start This road would not lead to fame All they really knew for sure Was Jesus had called to them He said, come follow me And they came With reckless abandon they came Empty nets lying there At the water's edge Told a story that few could believe and none could explain How some crazy fishermen Agreed to go where Jesus led With no thought for what they would gain For Jesus had called by name And they answered me with Abandon it all for the sake of the call No other reason at all But the sake of the call Only devoted To live and to die For the sake of the call Sake of the call Drawn like the rivers are drawn to the sea Well, there's no turning back For the water cannot help but flow Once we hear the Savior's call We'll follow wherever He leads Because of the love He has shown And because He has called us we will answer, we will abandon it all For the sake of the call, no other reason at all But the sake of the call, only devoted to live to die and not for the sake of a creed or a cause and not for a dream or a promise but simply because it is Jesus who calls and if we believe we'll obey and we'll answer oh we will obey of the call no other reason at all but the sake of the call only devoted to live and to die for the sake of the call for the sake of the call for the sake of the call